Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. I want to share some names with you. John Bowne, Frank Sprague, Louis Bossert, Alexander Turney Stewart. Each man played a vital role in the development of New York from Dutch trading post to world-class city. And they're just a few of the stars of this new book, A History of New York in 27 Buildings. A lively, fascinating read grappling with the question of whether bricks and mortar can reveal the soul of a city. Sam Roberts believes they can. That's why he wrote the book. Hey, who knows this city better than the urban affairs columnist of the New York Times? Sam is eager to share his knowledge with you next. Sam Roberts, so good to see you. Welcome. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Tony. I'm delighted. What a delightful book, too. History of New York and 27 Buildings. Um, before we get to it, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, remind you that Sam is also the host of New York Times Close Up here on CUNY every Friday night at 8 p.m. And I, in, in addition to being remiss, I'd probably be fired if I didn't mention it. <laughs> this, I, I guess, I, can I call this a whimsical history, a, a quirky history? I, mean, I hope so, because I remember when I went to public school in Brooklyn, uh, we didn't learn history like this. We no. learned dates and people and events by rote. Why? Boring. Uh, yeah, boring. And I remember uh, going to Alan Bennett's play, The History Boys, yes. and one of the kids is asked to define history, and he says, more or less, it's one damn thing after another. <laughs> and what I tried to do is make history interesting in this book, in my previous books, and make it quirky and make it uh, storytelling and well, make you, it a narrative. Well, you've, you've really uh, fashioned a great narrative here, and I, I can call the audience attention to your, your previous uh, version of New York City history and 101 objects, some of them being the checker cab and a conductor's baton and the oyster. Uh, but anyway, that was the other book. Get that one, too, if you want. But this uh, one, 27 buildings. You make no pretense, of course, obviously, that this list is definitive. Um, how'd you select them? Well, Tony, there are something like 700,000 buildings in New York. Uh, so this is not a definitive list. As you say, it's highly subjective. And I started off with some criteria. I wanted the buildings to exist. Uh, for the most part, I didn't want them to be in traditional guidebooks mm -hmm. or postcards or anything like that. I wanted them to be quirky. I wanted them to be either transformative in some way or uh, to epitomize some kind of transformative era or uh, event about New York, uh, and just to surprise people and make them think about history in some different way. Well. I learned uh, quite a bit about, and I'm a New Yorker. Well, the great thing about doing books like this, frankly, is that I keep learning. And, you know, working at the Times, I sort of get paid to get a postgraduate education yeah. uh, on the job. And I keep learning things doing books like this. Let's get to the book and some of those names I mentioned. John Bowne, The Bowne House in Queens and the Flushing Remonstrance. Right, I rem love. I love that. Isn't a remonstrance great? I mean, first of all, it sounds like something you would. Uh, flushing remonstrance sounds like a complaint to a plumber, maybe. Right. Uh, but yes. but what it is was the precursor to religious freedom in this country. Uh, this was a century before the Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. which, by the way, was approved in New York, not in Philadelphia, not in Washington, but in New York at another building uh, in this book. Uh, but what this was was telling Peter Stuyvesant, who was the director general then of New Amsterdam, that you can't discriminate against the Quakers. And one yeah, thing he that, was trying to ban right, their, he said Quakers, their religious. And, uh, and uh, you know, to be honest, Quakers were not you know these pacifist, nice, quiet people that we know today. They were Quakers. I mean, they were called Quakers for a reason. Uh, but. The Dutch uh, West India Company said, and this is what defined New York and made it different from all the other colonies in America, the Dutch 
did not come here to proselytize. They did not come here to escape religious persecution. They came here to make, make money. money. Yeah. And if you didn't interfere with that, you were pretty much okay. And they thought, obviously by their ruling in this, they thought old Peter was interfering. They thought he was interfering, and that was the foundation for if you want to be an idealist, you could say tolerance. If you want to be a cynic, you could call it indifference. But that was the foundation for religious freedom and the tolerance that New York and ultimately America became famous for. And as you say, a hundred years later, first we see it in, in Queens at, at and around the Bound House. Is it, and it's still there. The house is still there in Flushing and the uh, Quaker Meeting House nearby is still there as well. And one of those things that we sort of take for granted, people go by and have no idea of the historic significance of that place. Let's talk about Louis Bossert, whom I mentioned in the uh, uh, in the introduction, the Bossert Hotel in Brooklyn on Montague well, Street. Well, as a Brooklyn boy, I could not leave out something representing the yeah. Dodgers. Unfortunately, Ebbets Field is gone. The building that housed the Dodger headquarters is gone. The closest I could come was the Bossert, which was the uh, place where the Dodgers celebrated the World Series win, where some of the Dodgers 1955. lived. 1955. Yes, and that is still there. And uh, it, it sort of became emblematic. In fact, Louis Bossert was a builder, uh, provided some of the construction material for Ebbets Field. And the Bossert was a beautiful hotel at the time, overlooking it was called, uh, the called Manhattan the Waldorf Island. Astoria of uh, the Waldorf Astoria of, of Brooklyn. Brooklyn. That's right. Uh, the St. George was bigger. The Waldorf was uh, the Bossert was presumed to be a little bit classier, mm. uh, and great hotel, and still there. And do I read you correctly that it was in the Bossert that O'Malley held the vote? in 57 to say, we're leaving Brooklyn, we're going to L.A. I'm afraid so. It was a rigged vote, of course. Of course he already yeah. knew what he was doing, but he did hold a pro forma vote, and after that, the Dodgers fled. Yeah. Uh, I, as you write in the book, uh, uh, sort of recreating that scene, um, um, O'Malley chairing the meeting, saying, I know you all want to stay. I want to go, we're going. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, he had veto power. Yeah, he, he was the boss. Um, Frank Sprague and the IRT powerhouse, which was a, a fortress of a building on, what, fifth, between 58th and 59th? Yeah, over on uh, 11th, 11th Avenue, right near the river, near the Hudson River. Again, something we just take for granted, this big hulk of a building and few people realized that the facade, at least, was designed by Stanford White, mm. and it was intended to be a, uh, a monument to uh, industrialization. It was an attempt to make the neighborhood, this San Juan Hill neighborhood, yeah. Uh, really much classier than it was. It was a pretty dicey neighborhood. Oh, it was, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it was the the uh, site, ultimately, of West Side Story. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, this is where the whole IRT, original subway system, was powered. And it was just an amazing building, still there. Now I think it powers the kind of uh, steam system in part. But it, it, this was a great... Uh, picture of industrialization in New York and in America. And the idea in sort of the City Beautiful movement was to make it a work of art as well as a work of manufacturing, mm -hmm. generating power. And Frank Sprague was, was the engineer, I guess. Frank Sprague was uh, behind, the engineer. He, he was the brains behind elect, electri electrification of the of, of mass transit. Exactly. Of and, and the electrification meant that you could put trains underground. It meant you could uh, carry passengers in an efficient way. And that, of course, led to the subways and the commuter railroads as well. And as you point out in the book, greater New York as an entity wouldn't be possible without mass transit. No, you're, Tony, you're absolutely right. It started with the Brooklyn Bridge, which connected, yeah. obviously, Manhattan and Brooklyn. But it would not have been possible without the subway system. Uh, Frank Sprague, instrumental in that. Andrew Green created Greater New York as a political entity, but Frank Sprague and the subway made it a reality. 
Okay, another name, the fourth name I mentioned earlier, Alexander Turney Stewart and his Marble Palace. This guy was, this guy was quite a guy, a dry goods salesman from Scotland? Scotland, indeed, yeah. like Andrew Carnegie. Uh, Stewart uh, came over, you know, with very little money. He uh, was lucky, enough, he was a teacher in New York, was lucky enough to go back it, to Scotland with a minor inheritance, came back with some Irish linen, opened a store on Lower Broadway, and if you look right behind City Hall now, right behind the Tweed Courthouse, there's a lovely building, a clock on the corner of Broadway and Chambers that says The Sun, because mm -hmm. it ultimately became the Sun Building, the Sun newspaper. But this was the Marble Palace, which arguably was the first department store in America. Mm -hmm. And Alexander Stewart created that store uh, and became a multi, multi millionaire, one of the richest men, perhaps the richest man in America, and uh, created, as I say, what became. Uh, the first department store in the country, and a marketing genius. A palatial palace, I think it was called, and uh, you talk about this guy becoming uh, a zillionaire. It, they were doing uh, five, I think in, I, I forgot what year you pointed out, but they were doing $5 million in sales a year, which I did some math, works out to about $79 million now, and $79 million in those days. That's a lot of money. Absolutely, and this is before Macy's and before all those other yeah. stores. Uh, and as I say, he was a marketing genius. He, he sold cheap, he sold high quality, and this was literally the beginning of the carriage trade on Broadway. People, upper class people, came in carriages and stopped on Lower Broadway and went into the store and shopped, and uh, it was a phenomenon. The buildings at Broadway and Chambers, and what, now it's what, municipal offices? Now it's municipal offices. Uh, it was the Office of the Sun. It is now not particularly descript for most people. They'll pass it by. But in its day, it was a palace. I'm talking with uh, Sam Roberts about his latest book, uh, History of New York in 27 Buildings, and the subtitle is the 400-year untold story of an American metropolis. Pretty soon we're going to be 400. Not, yeah, pretty soon. Well, it is pretty soon, depending on which year you, you pick. Yeah. Uh, uh, it could be uh, 1624, 25, uh, whatever we like. I don't think we're doing much preparation for the quadricentennial, but uh, I think we should be. It's something worth celebrating. Oh, definitely. Well, let's get on it. Let's form a committee. Absolutely. Let's do it. You'll be the chair. I'll, I'll carry your... Oh, and we could be co-chairs. All right. I like that. Um, you know what was, uh, what was special, many things special about the book, but the, two of the things you cite in here are not buildings per se, but still they have a, uh, an important role in, in the development of the city and uh, Coney Island Boardwalk is one of them. Talk about that. Well, that was one of my favorites. I have to admit I defined uh, building rather loosely. Maybe That's structure is a, a better word. Uh, but the boardwalk I found fascinating because when the boardwalk was uh, built in the early 1920s, uh, at the turn of the century, the beach was really private. Uh, there was very little public access to the beach. The beach was for, for the rich. For the rich yeah. uh, Sheepshead Bay, Manhattan Beach were wealthy enclaves uh, in this city, in the metropolitan area. And two things made the beach democratic, opened the beach to immigrants to greater New York. One was the subway, subway. Uh, which opened it up completely, and the other was the boardwalk, which made it a total democratic uh, phenomenon. And uh, this became the second longest boardwalk in the world, next to Atlantic City, uh, and it got longer and wider as time went on. Uh, it's probably uh, an, uh, not exactly accurate to call it a boardwalk anymore, at least not wooden board, uh, but it is still there. Uh, it, it still attracts millions of people a year. Oh, sure. The beach is as good or better than ever. Uh, when you go around the world and look at beaches that are covered with pebbles or rocks or sharp objects, I don't think you could find a better beach than uh, the beaches on southern Long Island all the way from Montauk to 
Coney Island and beyond. I remember boardwalks, by the way, which were boardwalks, and the the danger was you get splinters. Uh, exactly. In your feet I, if I you're got, walking on. I got airport. my share of splinters, indeed. Uh, and Coney Island, you know, used to be a little more quaint uh, with with other things that were there that no longer are. But in a way, it's coming back, and the Cyclones and Dathans mm -hmm. are still there, and the aquarium has expanded. Uh, so, you know, when you look at things uh, uh, in terms of nostalgia, everything changes. But, uh, you know, certainly Brooklyn is, is coming back in ways that nobody ever would have imagined. Yeah, especially the people who used to live in Williamsburg and thought it was a nice blue-collar neighborhood. <laughs> and now, and now they, can't afford it. Now can't afford it. Exactly. Um, uh, City Hall is on the list. And uh, it was interesting to hear you say, and we've both spent a lot of time in that building, um, that it looks today pretty much the way it looked then when it was built. It's remarkable. It was built in the early 19th magnificent century. Book. Magnificent. Palatial. Book. It looks like a little chateau palace. And what's fascinating about uh, City Hall, it is the oldest continuously operating functional city hall in the country. Uh, we may leave out functional during various mayoralties, uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it is... It is I, I, I'm going to... I, okay, I'll I'm say that. tighten my tongue. No, because uh, I was going to mention a name. Yes, well, I could understand that. Uh, but, you know, it has been there. The, the city has grown enormously. Obviously, there are other city offices uh, that house various uh, city departments. But that is the centerpiece, the hub of city government, as it has been since the beginning of the 19th century. And it is still there. It is still beautiful. It is wonderfully restored. And that's where, that's the centerpiece of city government. Yeah, it's it's a magnificent building. And, and um, the double staircase oh. inside. And, I, I and guess that has a formal name, an architectural It, it does, name. and it's self-supporting, yeah. and, you know, it, uh, there are all sorts of architectural gizmos that explain yeah. that, but just an absolutely fascinating building. I have to tell you, uh, quite a few years ago, I became aware that there's a statue of, of justice at the very top of City Hall, on top of the dome. I became aware that that statue did not have, does not, or did not have, a blindfold, mm -hmm. which made for a great feature story about this is why you can't fight City Hall. I wonder if you know, there's, you can't see from the street, that you, you, it's too far up and too far away, you can't see with the naked eye. Um, I wonder if you know whether they've ever put the blindfold on. I don't know, but we'll find out. Although I mention in the book that uh, when they were uh, having a groundbreaking for the City Hall originally, they were shooting off cannon and broke the glass on somebody's store down the block. <laughs> he did fight City Hall. He sued, and he won. So, you know, the, the tradition of fighting City Hall goes way back. Oh, yeah, it does. Um, uh, 60 Hudson Street, which might not sound like you know, much of a look. It sounds like any other, you know, 29 West 44th Street, whatever. 60 Hudson Street is an interesting story because it was the headquarters of Western Union. And another magnificent, bold, strong-shouldered building. Um, and talk about why Western Union figures in the history of this city? Well, two reasons uh, that I included 60 Hudson. It's, again, a building you would just walk by given the address, even given the building, although at the time it was considered one of the most beautiful sort of industrial buildings in the city. One, Western Union was a enormously influential company in this city. Right. Originally, people actually told time by Western Union. There was a big ball on the original Western Union building on Lower Broadway, and when the ball came down, people knew that it was noon in the city. There was no other official way of telling time. And then, of course, the telegram became a, a you know, fact of life for people in this city communicating since the Civil War in terms of news, in terms of personal uh, communication, pre-telephone. And then uh, what the, the 
communication by, by telegram just became the, this romantic, uh, storied uh, form of communication yeah. that, you know, we still marvel at today. And at the Times, I think I wrote one of the last stories about the final telegrams before the system was shut down because it just became an anachronism. And now when people think of the internet, they think of this ephemeral, ethereal thing. But in fact, the internet is a collection of physical things, of wires, of computers, of servers. servers. And m many of those are located in that building. That building is a hub for the internet from all over the world. So it's sort of fascinating that the old use of the telegram and the telegraph that dates to the mid 19th century now has been repurposed to the 21st century internet. So there's a continuum there in terms of our communication that I thought was worth pointing out. It's definitely worth it. And, and um, it also gave you the chance to, to cite a famous telegram from uh, literary, I guess we could call it telegram, Totally honest. Yes, well, you remember that one better than I do, I think. Robert Benchley. Robert I Benchley, think. humorous yes. for the New Yorker. Right, and uh, he was sent to uh, Venice. Venice. He sends back a telegram to the New Yorker right. when he arrives in Venice saying, streets full of water, please advise. Right, please advise. <laughs> uh, many telegrams like that, some apocryphal, but I think most of them true. Tweet. Streets, streets flooded, please advise. Yeah, yeah. Um, great. That's why he was a humorist. That's right. Uh, the Tweed Courthouse. Uh, you know, we know Tammany Hall was corrupt. We know Bill Tweed was lining his pocket and, and eventually went to jail. I was astounded by the level, the amount of the money that they stole in a lot of, most of it in the, in the building of that building. Mm -hmm. It really is mind boggling. I mean, when you look at the amounts and translate them into, you know, $2,019, uh, it, it's just incredible uh, that they were allowed to get away with that until uh, Harper's Magazine, Thomas Nast, and the New York Times began to expose those frauds. Uh, they were just incredible. Uh, Three, it you is, know, in today's money, that courthouse cost three billion dollars. Um, uh, just amazing, and the building is beautiful. Yeah. Well, it, you I quote mean, you quote Paul Go uh, Goldberger, who was the architecture critic of the Times at the time, and his evaluation. Yeah, I mean, you could almost argue, in a sense, that it was worth it architecturally, but the boodle that these people stole. Uh, in terms of, of inflating bills and favorite contractors and all sorts of things like that. I mean, they totally ripped off the city uh, in every conceivable way, every contract, every favorite contractor, every relative, uh, ghost contracts. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, they, they did it by the book in terms of corruption. Uh, it was textbook uh, boodling and corruption. And it is a, a magnificent building within. Uh, now what? The Department of Education? Department of Education. Um, and, you know, what could be better than textbook corruption? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, there are so many other uh, buildings and structures in Sam's book, and I want to quickly touch on them before we run out of time. The American Banknote Plant in, in, in the South Bronx I, I producing... Love currency for all over the world. I love that one because here's, a, again, a beautiful factory, but in the middle of the poorest neighborhood in the country, you have this building that nobody knows about producing billions of dollars in currency, food stamps, other things. For China, for Mexico, for Brazil, for and, Everywhere. And for food stamps ultimately going to yeah. people in the neighborhood, and no one even knows it's there, you know, within blocks of this poorest neighborhood in the country. Now, it was set up sort of at the turn of the century. Or the, yeah, 19, in, the, in the 10, teens. So, but, but here it is yeah. as the neighborhood becomes, you know, this, this symbol, Charlotte Street, this symbol of urban poverty, and the place is still churning out literally billions of dollars in paper currency. Morris. And, and people go buy it and have no idea what's going on in that building.
more senior section of the Bronx. Uh, some of the other buildings Sam uh, touches on, the Apollo in Harlem, the Hunter College gym, the Domino Sugar Refinery, that's a lot to be said about that. The Empire State Building, Federal Hall, the Flatiron Building, the Lyceum Theater. Talk a little bit about the, well, the, the, I was, the Domino Sugar Factory now, of course, is, is completing its transformation into a, some more of these very high-priced condos. Exactly. They promise they will put the Domino sign back uh, when they've so. completed the conversion. But people, again, don't realize this was the largest sugar refinery in the world on the Brooklyn waterfront. And, you know, people forget that New York was a manufacturing town, that uh, much of what was made in the United States in virtually every field, every mm. form of manufacture was made in New York City. Uh, and Domino, you know, that Brooklyn plant, the Havemeyer family, was uh, the chief manufacturer of refined sugar. Yeah. Um, there's more. It's all in this book, History of New York in 27 Buildings. It's delightful to have you take us around the boroughs and with your unique insight into things of uh, uh, New York. So get the book and, um, and catch Sam on Friday nights on, on this channel because, as I said earlier, they'll fire me if I don't say that. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. It's good to see you, Sam. It really is. Thank you. And thank you for watching. I will see you soon.